My name is John LaBelle. I teach architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. This is a lecture from my fall 2014 course on the impact of technology. And here we're looking at the cultural stage on which technological development takes place. And we begin by quickly looking at the Newtonian clockwork universe and then Maxwell's fields and then relativity and quantum theory. And then we look at what I'm suggesting is the environment or cultural stage on which our technological developments are taking place today, and that is one of genomics. Now, I'm going to present a complicated idea here, so we can talk about it more as we go through the course. Let me go through this, and then we can uh, work with it <laughs> as we go. When I refer to the print world and the electronic, or electric, or electronic worlds. You might think of them as cultures, which I define as the stage on which we create. So this lecture, I'm looking at another idea, so it's called visionary creativity here. But I'm going to look at these different cultural periods. So if we have the literate world and the electric world. What what is our world today? So let's jump ahead and say the the world today, or any world, is there's a spirit of the age, which culture, worldview, I'm calling it a stage, all mean the same thing. But what what's going on at this different period? We think of some broad periods like the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, Modernism, Contemporary World. These would be these broad cultural periods. But we can also look at the sort of dominant technology of the time, literate, the book, electric, telegraph, uh, radio, telephone, digital, computer information world. And then is our world now affected by the fact that what we used to do at a desk in front of a computer is now mobile. I have a, a website, I have a bunch of websites. My techie is saying, we have to totally redo these. <laughs> you know, 60% of people are looking at these on their cell phone and what you've got doesn't work because it was designed for desktop. So, you know, is our world changing? And so let's look at the clockwork universe, the world of fields, the world of relativity and quantum theory, and today's world, which I'm calling genomic, and we'll see what we mean by that. This is a slightly different way of dividing it than McLuhan's um, literate and electric. And when we say spirit of the age, this applies to, since it's reworking your consciousness, and we do, we use our consciousness to do art, science, technology, business, the art, science, technology, and business of a given period will all share certain characteristics because they're all created by people with certain frames of mind or certain ways in which their consciousness works. So, one of these is the clockwork universe. So this is the universe of Isaac Newton, the universe of the book, universe of perspective. It assumes that an individual human being with a point of view uh, involved with a world that follows the laws of physics. So this is a little model of the solar system as a clock. Here's a famous perspective painting of uh, School of Athens by Raphael. So Isaac Newton said that space is continuous and uniform, but this is sort of the exact same thing that perspective painting said. So here's a sketch for a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. 
in which space is continuous and uniform. It's marked off by a 3D grid of perspective. This is the world of the printed book. Here's the Gutenberg Bible. Print um, leads to two things. One is uniformity, that every A is going to look like every other A because they were all mass produced and lead type. And means books will be cheaper, more prevalent, more people will read, and more people will get their consciousness rearranged by books sees the human being in these mechanistic terms so that we have uh, anatomical studies of the human being, the human being as machine. And then a home for this human being. We'll look at Plato's Villa Rotunda, which places the human being in the center of an X, Y, Z coordinates, which is also, the position of the human being is what gives us the perspective space of perspective painting. Okay, totally new world. We're in the late 1700s and then into the 1800s, and a world of fields. So, James Clerk Maxwell uh, works out electromagnetic magnetic field equations. He comes up with the idea that magnetism, electricity, and light are all the same thing. They're all manifestations of the electromagnetic field. So we're not sitting here in empty space, but the, we are surrounded by embedded in part of electromagnetic fields. This starts pervading our world, telephone, telegraph cables underwater circling the globe, radio. Um, the world is encircled by an electric net and every place is connected to every other place Effectively, instantaneously, it's the speed of light, the speed of electricity through the cables, but effectively, it's instantaneously connected. We look at a painting by Vincent van Gogh during this period. We see all is energized. The stars are not objects, but are swirling nodes in a continuous field. If you take a piece of paper and put it over a magnet and then you sprinkle iron filings on it, those iron filings will arrange themselves the way we see here and they are displaying to us the electromagnetic field. It's there, we don't see it, but all I have to do is put up an antenna and our radio or TV will pull it in um, unless we've given up on that and our TV is now cable. But uh, it could be pulling it in. Well, and we're using it in Wi-Fi. So this room is filled with these Wi-Fi fields right now that my uh, computer's picking up or um, uh, signals that our cell phones are picking up. We move into the 20th century and we have relativity and quantum theory. In relativity, the it begins with an observation that the speed of light is always constant no matter how we're moving. So if you're a batter and a pitcher is throwing a ball at you at 100 miles an hour, and now the pitcher's standing on top of a car that's coming toward you at 50 miles an hour. So now the ball is going 150 miles an hour. If the car is going away at 50 miles an hour, the pitcher throws a ball at 100 miles an hour, it comes to you at 50 miles an hour. But light doesn't do that. If I have a flashlight coming toward me or going away from me, the speed of light from the flashlight to me is always the same. So uh, 
that led to the basis of Einstein's theory of relativity, which holds that the there is no uniform space or time. In other words, the light was going to be going through what was called the ether. Light waves have to be propagated through something, they'd be propagated through the ether, and if we move relative to the ether, the speed of light would be different. Einstein said, there's no ether. There are no fixed frames of reference. Everything is relative. And around the same time, uh, later, his general theory of relativity says, gravity is not a force. Gravity is a distortion in space-time. So that if I drop this, if I let go of this, it's actually standing still. In space-time, which is dynamically collapsing into the Earth. So the Earth distorts space-time, and this follows the lines of that distorted space line and looks like it's falling. So the, everything is dynamic without any fixed frames of reference. And then quantum theory tells us if we have a light source, and we have two slits in a screen in front of the light. Light goes through these slits as waves and these waves interfere with each other, and where the peaks of the waves overlap, it gets lighter, and where the a peak and a trough overlap, they cancel each other out and it gets dark. So we have these bands of light and dark from the waves interfering with each other. Okay. But then, if we say, but light is also particles. So I want to know which slit the particles go through. If we set up the experiment to see particles, we will get light will behave as particles. If we set it up to for light to act as waves, it will act as waves. So the light detects what we're doing and acts differently depending on how we're observing it. So suddenly our consciousness becomes a part of reality. And so the British astronomer and physicist James Jean says, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. So mind is no longer an accidental intruder, but a fundamental part of reality. And in a Cubist painting by Picasso, it's our motion around the subject that determines what it will be like. There is no fixed subject, but it's different depending upon our point of view as we are in motion. There is no fixed objective observer. And time is not fixed. Time is dependent on our experience of it so that what two, whatever, gunshots could be simultaneously for one observer, but then one came before the other for another observer, and the other came before the one for yet a third observer. So time is not fixed. There's no uniform, universal clock, but time is a consequence of events. There's a painting by Salvador Dali of melting watches. And our uh, culture becomes absorbed into each one of us. Rather than existing exteriorly, objectively, uh, Carl Jung is interested in how the whole cult, your psychology is made up of the entire history of our culture. And so there are these archetypal images in your unconsciousness that comes from the history of our culture. And the mythologist James uh, Joseph Campbell writes, the latest incarnation of Oedipus, the continued romance of Beauty and the Beast, stand this afternoon on the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue waiting for the traffic light to change. In other words, these great myths are interiorized into the psychologies of each one of us. 
Here's James Joyce who does that with his um, novel Ulysses. Here's his character Bloom who is living out the adventures of Odysseus in his everyday life in Dublin, Ireland. But what I just described, which is sort of foundational to modernism and modern art, was 100 years ago. <laughs> What's the world like today? So I'm going to propose that it's fundamentally genomic. So Stephen Wolfram says, when Isaac Newton said, we can describe the workings of the universe with differential equations, he made a mistake. Yes, differential equations work with certain things like planetary orbits, work very well for that. But, can you describe a cloud, a tree, a coastline, the path, the jagged path of lightning with differential equations? And Bernoit Mandelbrot, inventor of fractals, says, a tree is not a cylinder, a cloud is not a sphere, a coastline is not straight, nor is the path of lightning. So what we have been doing for the past hundred years is ignoring everyday phenomena in our lives and just saying, well, I don't know. Um, you know, that's not really, it, it looks random, but ultimately our science will be able to explain it. And Stephen Wolfram says, we've been approaching it all totally the wrong way. And he suggests that if you look at the, a tree, and then you look at the branches of the tree, and then you look at the twigs of a tree, and then you look at the veins in a leaf, they'll often all look similar in the patterns in them. He says, that's because the tree has a rule set. It's got a set of rules. And it keeps reusing those rules for making itself. And it says, nature actually works not by differential equations, but like software. There's a set of rules. And they're actually not that complicated. If you can use recursion, uh, recursiveness, and anybody do programming? So uh, in recursion, you can keep reusing certain rules. You say go to or recall that that pattern of rules that I stated earlier in my software and use it again. So Wolfram says, I think when I find the code that generates our world, it'll be about six lines. So there's six lines of rules that make the entire reality that we exist in. And uh, starting with this approach, he's able to say, well, what are all the different possible worlds? What is, what is the range of possible structures of logic? And he says, of all the possible logics, ours is about 50,000. You start with the simplest one and you keep going. When you get to about 50,000, you get one that looks like the world we live in. And so he looks at our world in the universe of possible worlds. And all these worlds are described by different sets of rule sets. And there's a Hindu myth of what's called Indra's net. Indra's net is a great chandelier of jewels. Each jewel reflects all of the other jewels. And when you look into one of the jewels, you see a reflection of one of the other jewels. In the facets of the jewel that you're looking at in the reflection, you'll see all the other jewels ad infinitum. Suddenly, we begin to realize that's what our world looks like. There's a term called the multiverse. Our Big Bang universe is, imagine you had a soda bottle and you pop the cap off and all the bubbles suddenly appear in the soda. Our universe is one of those bubbles. And the appearance of that universe is our Big Bang. 
but there's infinite other universes in the multiverse of which we are just one. Occasionally two of these universes are pumped into each other. Um, there's an idea we have in physics today called entanglement. Two particles interact and then one of them stays here, the one, other one flies off and it's out near Pluto somewhere. If we observe that this particle has a left-hand spin, it will establish that this one has a right-hand spin. If we set up our experiment differently to see if it has an up or down spin, and we see it's got an up spin, this one will have a down spin. So we can change what's happening instantly on the other side of the universe to what we do to a particle right here. And not only that, we can change something that happened a million years ago by how we observe something. So this is entanglement in quantum theory. So everything in the universe is, everything going on in Alpha Centauri is right now reflected in my fingernail. Everything is totally connected, like in his net. It's all patterns of information that are interconnected. So what does entanglement tell us? That particles potentially reflect each other across the universe, or stated another way, existence is made up of relationships rather than space and time and causality. It's just like in Drusnet. DNA, genomics, fractals. So DNA is a set of rules. You've got four letters in your alphabet, A, T, C, and G, and A and T can link, link and C and G can link, so you have two rules, and these uh, DNA, we'll go into DNA, these DNA uh, letters can generate RNA, and the RNA makes protein, and the protein is the organism. So, <clears throat> DNA is a set of rules that makes an organism. This is a cellular automata, which is a pattern that Stephen Wolfram works with. And <clears throat> you have a set of rules. So we've got, take these three squares right here. If these three squares are black, the one below it in the middle will be white. That's your rule. If they are black, black, white, the one below it will be black. If they're white, if they're black, white, black, the one below it will be white. So there are eight possible rules. There's 256 possible sets of these things. This rule set generates this pattern. This is a Mandelbrot set. It's a rich fractal developed by Bernard Mandelbrot, founder of, uh, discoverer of fractals. Um, this is DNA, four letters, two rules. Adenine links with thymine, guanine links with cytosine. From that, you make all of life. A pattern was discovered in 1953 by Watson and Crick. Today, J. Craig Venter uh, has a company that develops synthetic life. Uh, they put together DNA to make organisms that do stuff we want to do. I told you about the spider goat. We'll go into that more in a couple weeks. Wolfram, in a new kind of science, uh, explores this rule-based approach to understanding the universe. As you know, I don't think nature is using differential equations. Nature is using these rules. The famous uh, designer, architect, mathematician, Buckminster Fuller says, you know, I sit on the back of my sailboat and I watch the bubbles being churned up in the foam. And I said, how many places does nature carry out pie before she rounds it off to make a bubble? Here's a Mandelbrot set. And we can zoom in on it.
keep zooming in. We start seeing patterns that look like random box sets. Now, you, you, have, you start with a formula, you solve the equation, and you make a dot. You run the equation again, you make another dot. Well, it's very tedious. <laughs> it wasn't until they had powerful computers that you could make the dots very quickly, and they make these patterns. And they are literally infinite. The infinite complexity. You can zoom in on this guy forever as long as your computer is powerful enough to keep running these equations. So, what do DNA and genomics tell us? That simple rules can build the rich universe in which we live. And the outcomes of these rules are regulated by as yet not fully understood principles. So in chaos theory, we're just starting to study how this stuff unfolds. Symbiogenesis. Lynn Margulis, her son is Dorian Sagan, Carl Sagan's the father. Um, Lynn Margulis is a biologist, died a few years ago. And she says, Darwin got it all wrong. Evolution does not move by natural selection, competition. Rather, bacteria is the unit. And bacteria are very good at moving around DNA. So if you take too much the wrong kind of antibiotic, you get antibiotic resistant bacteria in you, that bacteria can move that antibiotic resistance to other bacteria. They're very good at moving DNA around. Viruses also. Viruses work by injecting their DNA into your cells and hijacking them to make them make more viruses. So Lemargulis says evolution works by bacteria and viruses moving around DNA and uh, to make unique new organisms. And the real unit of re biological reality are bacteria. It says it's like a pointless painting, meaning Surat Sunday in the Park. We'll see that in a sec. Uh, like the Surat's famous painting in the park. Look closely. The points are living bodies, different distributions of bacteria. So it looks like discrete organisms, but it's actually just seas of bacteria. So we now understand that we walk around with two pounds of bacteria in our body, about the, as much bacteria as the weight of our brain. And this bacteria is not something you want to get rid of. It's absolutely fundamental. It's part of what we are, a lot of it in our stomach. Of all the different genes in our body, 23,000 of them are human, and a million plus are bacterial. 90% of the DNA in our body is bacterial. It's not even human. And we're exchanging it all over the place. <laughs> we're just blowing it around interactively. It's all networked, like all of your likes on, on Facebook. So Facebook is one big biome. So what does symbiogenesis tell us? That our world that once seemed made up of discrete entities, like individual human beings, is now totally interconnected, each element containing and reflecting the rest. It's all one huge cluster of interactive networks. Information. We are in seas of information. What does information theory tell us? That the fundamental component of reality is information. Translatable, storable, and transmittable at the speed of light. Chaos. When the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. We'll go into this when we get to it. But uh, Lorenz is famous for titling a paper, um, 
Does a butterfly flapping its wings in, Pe in Beijing cause a hurricane in Austin, Texas? In other words, a tiny disturbance in one place magnifies into whole huge changes everywhere. It's causal, but totally unpredictable. It's one of the problems with um, trying to predict future climate. You know, to say, oh, we can tell you the temperature within a tenth of a degree in 50 years. I can't even tell you if it's going to rain tomorrow. Uh, you know, so, well, you know, it's the rough overall average. Well, no, chaos tells us that rough overall averages is not how it works. One little change can make the whole system totally different. And things tend to move toward patterns. This is called a strange attractor. And so that particles tend to move in certain patterns independent. This could be grains of sand in a sand dune. It could be uh, particles in water. It could be uh, subatomic particles all making the exact same pattern. So these patterns seem to have um, universal applicability. So what does chaos theory tell us? That seemingly chaotic behavior can converge on patterns regardless of the material of the system, in the system, and regardless of disturbances to the system. So, what's our world like today if it's no longer the electronic universe of the blue end? And I'm going to give you an ugly agglomeration of mixed metaphors. So, it's, we start with Georges Seurat's painting, Sunday afternoon in the park. These look like discreet, classic people separate human beings. But then we zoom in. We find all is a sea of dots. And each of these dots are particles that are intertwined with others. They're all spreading. They are following certain rules. They move into certain patterns, and they're all networked. Now, in that environment is going to be the art forms of the future. I'm going to suggest that the key art forms of our future are not going to be painting, sculpture, but rather the art form of our time is business. The people who have a sense of what's going on and then render that into something are the people founding social media companies. I'm going to get a little bit gross. Mark Zuckerberg's insight when he founded Foot Facebook was, what do people want in college want to know? What's the key thing they want to know? Who's dating whom? Who's boinking whom? You know, who, 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 went to the, who went to which party last night? Who broke up with whom? Who's now dating whom? Who's, that's what they want to know. He created a vehicle for the one thing that all college kids want to know, unless they're in architecture school where they want to actually work, and uh, which is what are the current patterns of social interrelationships of everybody. And so all these things are based on what I was just talking about these patterns of interrelations that are driving our fundamental underlying organization. So one of the more recent ones is Tumblr, a microblogging platform and social network website. 
It posts most multimedia and other content to a short form blog, follow other users' blogs, make their blogs private or public. So here's this kid, David Carp. He's going to Bronx Science, and he hates school. He can't wait to get home uh, and go down into the basement and play with his computer. So his mother said to him, what? Well, his mother said, you know what, why don't you drop out of high school? You're not enjoying it. What do you, you know, you enjoy your computer, hang out with your computer. He was working for somebody who wanted him to create a video platform for computers. And he said, I'm not going to do that. He said, you're working for me. This is what I want. He says, I can't do that. That's so 2000. Nobody uses a computer anymore. It's all mobile. He's a digital native. He lives in this world. He created Tumblr, sold it for a billion dollars. So these are people, what I just described, this whole thing here, the creative minds of our future, our technologies of our future, are going to be created by not people who intellectually understand this, but who just live it. This is the world they live in. This is reality, isn't it? <laughs> um, as opposed to living in linear logical books. So we look like the class, we, we, we look like four individuals in this room. We look like the classical figures in Sunday in the Park painting, but we're actually the dots that you see when you look close up. And all of the dots are connected and they're all computing by following simple rules. It's all webs of interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves. So you want to know what the reality of our time is? That's it. That's the world we live in, as opposed to Newton's Clockwork Universe or Maxwell's Fields. <laughs>